In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. I refer to that passage to explain or to stress what a great privilege it is for me to uh, be able to speak the word of God on his behalf. I would not give this up for anything else under the sun. So I thank God today for the great privilege of being able to speak for him. And I pray that as you listen, that this life-changing word, this creative word, which brought the worlds into existence, will do something in your life. And as your life is brought closer and closer to Christ, Christ will use your life to inspire someone else to come to him. And so let's praise God for life. Let's praise him for sanity. Let's praise him for the ability to worship without persecution, depending on where you're listening to this program. Let's thank God from the foundation of our hearts. Our subject for today, the second time around. The second time around. Now, I always ask people when I speak to think, but particularly do I ask you to think as you listen to this presentation, the second time around. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Father in heaven, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. We want to understand the truth as it is in Jesus. And so I ask you today, God, to grant to us a revelation of your will as it is expressed in your word. Open our eyes, dear Father. Enlighten our understanding. I humble myself before you. I seek no glory. I'm very conscious of Isaiah 42, verse 8, which says, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory will I not give to another. And so, Father, my desire in my weak way is to point all the glory to you. But, Father, but to be an instrument of blessing to those who listen. Hear this humble prayer. Let your spirit take control, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our subject the second time around. Go with me to a Mark chapter 5. In that chapter is a story that is very, very well known. The story of the woman with the issue of blood. She had been sick a number of years, wasted her money on professionals, none of whom offered any help to her. And uh, she heard that Christ was in the area. She knew of his power. And she determined in her heart, if she could simply touch his clothes, she would be healed. And so in verse 28, for she said, if I may but touch his clothes, I shall be whole. Mark 5, 28. In 29, the Bible says, and immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body she had been healed of that plague. Now verse 30 is interesting. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him turned him about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? What I want to stress is the fact that virtue went out of Jesus. The word there, virtue, means power. It cost Jesus something to heal that woman. Now, Jesus, being man and God in his humanity, in his divinity, he knew the woman, he knew her condition. She knew she was trying to reach him. He knew that. Now, I'm saying all of this because Remember, Jesus is in the crowd and the disciples rebuked him. What do you mean who touched you? You see the crowd, how can you ask who touched you? Everyone is touching you, but everyone was not healed. Just that woman, which means that Christ deliberately and intentionally released power to heal that woman. He, her healing cost Christ something. What did it cost him? Some power. Virtue went out. Of course, God's storehouse of power is unlimited. But every time Christ performed a miracle, virtue went out. It cost him something to heal that woman. Now, physical healing is a symbol for spiritual healing. Which means, when God heals us spiritually, when God forgives, when God restores When God gives us victory over a weakness, it costs him something. Virtue goes out as verily as virtue went out of Christ when he purposefully, deliberately, and intentionally healed that woman because of her faith. Let me say again, it costs God 
something to forgive, to heal physically or spiritually. The question then I have to ask, what did it cost God to save us? Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, our subject, the second time around. Please think, please listen. Even though you may be in your homes, please turn your phones off so there's no disturbance. Uh, don't even answer the house phone. Just listen closely and carefully. Genesis 2 verse 7. The Bible says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. In that verse, we are informed that God gave life to Adam. It took power for God to do that. In verse 8, the Bible says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed, or he had made. Now, we must not think that God went about actually physically putting trees in the ground. No, everything was done by his word. But the word of God has power, and the power is the very life of God. You see, God's word has his power, his life, his holiness. So when the centurion said, speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed, that why would the servant be healed? Because the word has the very life of God. The word has the very power of God in it. And every time God speaks that word, and that word does something miraculous, virtue goes out of God. And so when God made Adam, it required power of the word. When God planted the garden eastward in Eden, it required power to go out. Verse 9. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that's pleasant to the sight and good for food. That's verse 9 of Genesis 2. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so we have God making Adam in verse 7 of Genesis 2. That required power to go out of God through his word. He made a home in verse 8. That required power. He made the fruit trees and all trees. That required power. In verse, uh, let's go to verse, uh, let's say 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. The creation of Eve required some power from God. Everything God made available to Adam required power from God. Now, our subject is the second time around. We know that Adam sinned. In Genesis chapter 3, reading from verse 6, the Bible says, And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. They sinned. Let's make a list of all the things God did for Adam and Eve. Verse 7, he gave Adam life. Verse 8 of Genesis 2, he gave him a home. Verse 9, a source of food. Verse uh, 15, work. Verse 16, 17, he gave him the power of choice. Verse 18, companionship. Verse 19, when he named the animals, he gave him dominion. Verses 21 to 23, he gave him marriage. And of course, in verses 2 and 3 of Genesis 2, God gave Adam the Sabbath. The question is, what did it cost God to give all those things to Adam? Let's lay aside Adam for a while. Let's go to Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, verse 3, the Bible says, And God said, Let it there be light, and there was light. It cost God something to make that light. Power. Power went out of him. The light on verse 1. The firmament on, uh, on day one, the light on day one. The firmament, day two. Dry land and uh, the sea, day three, along with vegetation. Day four, sun, moon, and stars. Day five, birds of the air, fish of the sea. Day six, all the land animals and the creeping things, along with mankind. This work of creation, it cost God a certain degree of power to do it. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made 
Psalm 33, verse 6, and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done, he commanded, it stood fast. In uh, Hebrews 1, verse 10, God the Father says of Jesus, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. How did Jesus do that? By power. And I have to keep stressing this, by his power. Power goes out of God every time he does something for us. Let's go back now to Genesis 2, verse 7. God made Adam, gave him life. But it did not require the life of God to give Adam life. Think with me now. It did not require the death of God to give Adam life. It did not require the death of God to create all the animals on day six. It did not cost God his life to make the birds of the air and the fish of the sea in, uh, on day five of creation week. Even though all of them get their life from God. In Psalm 36 verse 9, the Bible says, For with thee is the fountain of life. All life is somehow connected to God. Nothing can live disconnected from God. Let me be a little more severe. Nothing can exist disconnected from God. God made things that were animate. That's life. The animals, human beings, trees in a certain way, a certain sense, they're living. He made the rocks. Now we say that rocks are inanimate. That's as far as we know. But Jesus said, if the disciples hold their peace, the stones would cry out. Somehow, those stones can relate to the Creator. When Jesus said, peace be still, the winds kept quiet. They obeyed God. Now, how can an inanimate thing obey God? I don't know. So when we say animate and inanimate, we are confessing the limited nature of our understanding. What I'm saying is, everything exists, animate or so-called inanimate, by the power of God. Life or existence is attached to God. I was in a certain country, the face of the earth, preaching. And I was staying in a guest house owned by a member of the local church. And I was the only person in that house. And I enjoyed the solitude very much as I prepared from day to day. And I would walk out of the house. It was sunny every day. And I would stay in the sun for about 40 minutes, memorizing, reciting, praying, reflecting on what I had to say, enjoying the tremendous privilege of traveling to speak for God. And I came across a little flower growing out of the concrete. And every day, not every day, but frequently, I went to that flower. I sat down on a little wall, and I just looked at that little flower. And I said to myself, Father, that flower is alive because of you. Somehow, that flower's life is connected to you because nothing can live disconnected from God. And it took some effort for me to swallow that. And I looked at a blade of grass, green, waving in the wind, and I said, Lord, I have to believe your word and the counsel of your servant. That blade of grass lives because somehow it is connected to you. We read in Colossians 1 verse 16, For by him were all things created. Now what all things are those? Let me introduce something to you very carefully. Listen carefully. Before God made this earth and the part of the universe attached to this earth, there were other places in existence. There were worlds where people lived who had never fallen. The angels lived somewhere. There were other places in existence before God made this earth. Understand that very clearly. So when Colossians says, for by him were all things created, before this earth was made, the angels were existing. They existed somewhere in heaven. That was made by Christ. And all the angels lived because they were connected to the creator, and that creator is Christ. And you'll forgive me for stressing this because I need to stress it as I make the central point of our message, which is the second time around. All the angels connected to Christ because you cannot live disconnected from God. Uh, let me also say, even the devil is alive because God lets him live. 
Now, with all these angels, how many are there? We don't know. Thousands and thousands, 10,000 10, times, 10,000. We cannot count the angels. Each one draws life from God. Every animal draws life from God. Every unfallen being on unfallen worlds draws life from God. Every tree draws life from God. Every, you name it, draws life from God. And yet, God maintains the whole universe but it does not cost him his life. And I hope that's very clear. And so God made man in his own image. He breathed his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. Now let's go to uh, verse 16 and verse 17 of chapter 2, our subject, the second time around. God said, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst Freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Now God introduces death as a possibility. Adam had no clue what death was. No one in the universe knew what death was. But God tells Adam, if you sin, you will die. Now Adam sinned and he died. Spiritually, he died. Why do I say he died spiritually? Well, it required the life of Christ to, to revive him. If we read in Ephesians 2 verse 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. To quicken is to bring alive. Adam died spiritually. Here's a question for us now as we contemplate the subject the second time around. Now, the first time God gave Adam life, let me repeat, it did not cost God his life. <laughs> when Adam sinned, and he died spiritually. In order to give him life the second time, it cost God his life. In other words, salvation is the most expensive thing in the universe. Not creation, not physical creation, spiritual creation. Let me say it again. When God made Adam in Genesis 2, 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Breathe into his nostrils the breath of life. God gave Adam life without giving up his life. When Adam sinned and a spiritual revival was required, God did not breathe some life to accomplish that. God had to give his life. He had to die in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. What does that mean for the value of one sinner? Here's the universe. Here's God. Which is greater, the life of God or the universe? Clearly, the life of God. Now, the universe is vast. I mean vast. If I am to believe what I read, hundreds of billions of galaxies, I'm told, have been discovered. Two to three hundred billion. Now, one galaxy is big enough. We're told in the Milky Way, our galaxy, there are 400 is it million or billion stars. Now, if there are billions of galaxies, only God can measure the universe. By the way, as large as the universe is, it is not infinite. Only God is infinite. But it is so huge, only God can understand the size of the universe. I'm stressing this deliberately. But God himself is bigger than the universe. Nothing is bigger than God. Now, the life of God, which is greater than the universe, is the payment God makes for the salvation of the soul of a sinner. Then what are you worth to God? What is that drunkard worth to God? What is that prostitute worth to God? God has paid a price that exceeds the entire universe. And that price is not simply for the world. That price is for one person who goes astray. How can I put it simply? You are worth more to God than the whole world. You are worth more to God than the universe. Why? Because the salvation of your soul requires the very life of God. When God gave life the first time, 
to Adam. Genesis 2, 7, God did not have to die. It did not cost his life. But for God to revive Adam spiritually, it required the life of Christ. Salvation of a sinner requires the life of God. God goes to any extreme to save. Let's read this. Going to any extreme. Let's go to Luke 15. We shall read from verse 1. I was subject the second time around. Why that subject? The first time God gave life to Adam, it did not cost God his life. The second time around, having sinned, died spiritually, it costs God his life. And the life of God is greater than the entire universe. Luke 15, reading from verse 1. The Bible says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. By the way, let me just digress briefly. There was something about Christ that just drew sinners to him. He was not a condemning person, as I tend to be. Christ just drew them. And those of us who are Christians, there should be something about us that draws the sinner to us, that we might point the sinner to Christ. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners, for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. We're talking about the determination of God to save up to and included his own life. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, we go down to verse 4 of Luke 15. What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them out of a hundred, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which was lost until he find it. That word until is powerful. What it tells me is that God is prepared, was prepared, and has made salvation available at any cost. And Ella White writes, I believe it is a Desire of Ages, page 690, paragraph 3, he would save man at any cost to himself. When God made Adam, he did not make Adam at any cost to himself. Because it did not cost his life, the greatest cost to a person is loss of life. That's why the Bible says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. I say again, with respect, when God made Adam the first time, he didn't, it did not cost God his life. And so we're told the shepherd goes after that lost sheep until he finds it. That is a God going to any length, paying any price to save one soul. Now, we hear words like that, and they just pass over our heads because we don't live in a world where people love one another that way. And so it's difficult to accept the words of God. But the teaching of the Bible is very clear. God goes after that sheep until now. You remember that David, as a boy, he killed a bear. He also killed a lion. You remember that Samson caught 300 foxes, tied their tails together, and put them torches between their tied tails, loosed them into the crops of the Philistines, burned down their crops. You remember that uh, wild animals pop up in the Bible all the time. What does that mean? Today, there are no wild animals in the Middle East, virtually a couple, maybe wolves somewhere. But there are no lions, there are no bears, there are no hyenas. In the days of David and Christ, those wild animals were there. So when the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes out into the wilderness, he does that at the risk of his life. In other words, the shepherd is willing to lose his life to save one sheep. Now Jesus says, I say unto you that likewise, Luke 15, 7, Likewise, there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety-nine which need no repentance. Jesus is saying the same way that shepherd took on all the risks of wandering the wilderness to find one silly sheep. Christ himself went the distance to make salvation available. And so I say to you again, my beloved brothers and sisters, or I ask you the question, what did it cost God to give Adam life the first time? The answer is, it cost him some power. It did not cost him his life. The follow-up question is, what did it cost God 
to give life the second time because our subject is the second time around and it cost God his life, meaning that God paid the highest price he could pay for the salvation, not simply of the world, but for the salvation of one human being as told in the story of the lost sheep. My brothers, my sisters, you are so valuable to God. Your value is measured by the life given up on Calvary. And it is that life that sustains the entire universe. Let me say that again. It is the life of Christ that sustains the entire universe. And therefore, the life of Christ must be greater than the entire universe. And that was the life God voluntarily laid down in order that one sinner might be saved. You are worth more to God than the universe. One sinner. No wonder. The Bible says in Hebrews 2 verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? When you consider the second time around, it cost God his life to provide salvation from sin. You look at the life of God given for you. Can you give up an earring for God? Considering God gave up his life for you, can I give up a cigarette for God? Can I give up toenail polish for God? Seeing that God has given his life in his son for my salvation, what is it that I am unwilling to give up for God, realizing that God withheld nothing? Listen to Jesus giving another parable in the very same chapter, the parable of the lost boy, as we call the prodigal son. When the prodigal boy came home, the father made a feast. The older boy was very upset, and he would not go into the house. So the father came out. The father said to him, son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. How many times have we read that and read right over it? Now, this is a parable Jesus told to express how he and the father receive a sinner. The father said to that boy, all that I have, not some. All of heaven is at the disposal of the sinner. All that I have is thine. That has not changed. Everything God has, by giving up Christ, God is saying to us, every resource in the universe is at your disposal if that's what you need to be victorious over sin. Our subject, the second time around. The first time, Genesis 2, 7 and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. When God did that, let me repeat, it did not cost him his life to give Adam physical life. But when Adam sinned and God had to revive him, that's justification. That's the new birth. That's pardon. When God had to do that, the price for that was the very life of God. And so I ask you, my listening friend, are you aware of how much God has paid for your life? That's why the Bible says, for you bought with a price. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Acts 20, verse 29. His blood is a reference to his life. The blood is just the vehicle through which the life is offered. You pour out the life by pouring out the blood. Acts, uh, not Acts, Genesis, uh, Leviticus 17, 11, the life is in the blood. Genesis 9, 4, the life is in the blood. And that life is the life that sustains the entire universe. My listening friend, wherever you are, I want you to take some time and contemplate this shattering reality that the entire universe is not as precious to God as you are. Because God made the entire universe without sacrificing his life. Yes, what I'm saying is strange. Yes, what I'm saying is difficult to believe. But you answer the question, did God have to die to create the universe? No. 
Did he have to die to create the world? No. Did he have to die to save us? Yes. Now, there's a lot we don't understand, but the life of Christ, the sacrifice of Christ was an infinite sacrifice. How an infinite life can be lived in a human body, I can't understand. That's why the Bible says, a body has thou prepared me. The Father specially prepared a body for Jesus, that in that body he might live an infinite life and pay an infinite price. But whether you understand fully or not, it is very clear that the cost of your salvation and mine is the very life of God. And I've said it three or four times, I must say it again because I want you to think. Here is creation. Heaven and the earth. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and it did not cost his life. Some power, yes. Ah, but when it came to the salvation of that soul, the price was something that exceeded the cost of the universe, and that was the very life of God. It not only tells us how loving God is, it also tells us something of the nature of sin. Sin is such a problem. Sin is so powerful that the only response effective is the very life of God, which is everything God has. Anything less, and sin cannot be managed. And so the gift of God teaches us two things. One, the tremendous love of God and two, the tremendous problem that sin is. How can you and I live lives of sin, knowing that sin costs God his life? Yes, Calvary expresses the love of God and the hideous nature of sin. It's like a coin, heads and tails. Head, the love of the Godhead, tails, the dragon and his tail that seeks always to bring God's people down, to destroy the universe, to destroy earth. The devil is bent on destruction. God is committed to life. And so Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He says, I am come that they might have life. And that life is absolutely and entirely dependent on the life of God himself. And so my dear friends, I ask you, as an act of intelligence, the only intelligent, reasonable thing to do is to accept that sacrifice by faith and to take some time. One of the reasons the Bible makes little sense to us, we don't meditate on the scriptures. We're told in Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate. Day and night. Now, day and night means all day. Does it mean that all day, all you do is read the Bible? No, it simply means whether you're working as a doctor, a dentist, a carpenter, you're cleaning the streets, you're fixing electrical lines, whatever you do, you do it with the consciousness that God is with you. Meditating in God's word, day and night. And I urge you, meditate on what you've heard, this message called the second time around. Meditate. Try to imagine the vastness of the universe, measured in light years. I'm told to get to the sun, it'll probably take a few years. To get to Mars, a few months, six months, I think they say. That's far. Try to imagine the universe, vast, large. <laughs> and then think of the life of God greater than that. It was that life God gave for you. What's the decent thing for you to do? Give your life to God. Your small, little, limited life. Give it to him. Because he has given his life <clears throat> for you. You know, when God forgives, he takes away our sin, he gives us righteousness. Righteousness is life. And what life does he give us? Not our life. Not the life of an animal. Not the life of Enoch. Not the life of Gabriel. He gives us his life. And so he says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. When you, are, when you come to God and you attach yourself to Christ, that's how you come to God, through Christ. The very life that made the universe is the life that flows in you. Let me say that again. The very life that created the universe, the very life that sustains the universe 
is the life that flows and works in a person who has connected himself or herself to his Savior. And so I leave you with the second time around. Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. God gave Adam life, but it did not cost God his life. When God gave Adam life spiritually, it was on the basis of the life of Christ as symbolized by the animals sacrificed in the garden whose skin provided the robes with which Adam and Eve were clothed before they were sent out of the garden. Give your life to a God who values you above the world, above the universe. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you today, God, for this tremendous truth our value to you, the value of one sinner is measured by the very life of Christ. And who is Christ? He was the one who said, let there be light. Who is Christ? He is the one of whom it is said, and in him all things consist, the creator and sustainer. His life is the measurement, the expression of his love for us. Dear God in heaven, as we contemplate the tremendous cost of our salvation. Let that melt our hearts. Let that soften and break down the Jericho walls of our stubbornness. And let us give our sinful lives to our Savior, that he may cover us with his perfect life. Let your Spirit, dear God, enter our hearts to lead us to that point of surrender. Bless all those listening to your word. And when you come into your kingdom, dear God, save us without losing one. Thank you for paying such a high price for our salvation. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.